Today I'm with Phil Wedgwood, the CEO of Recoup, a relatively recent entrant into the law firm time recording market, but over the last 12 months the company has been significantly expanding its market share both within the UK and internationally. Phil, welcome. As one of the newer, smaller entrants into the market, why did you do it? You're up against a couple of big practice management vendors globally. You're up against a couple of uh, specialist time recording companies. Um, why did Rico think there was room in the market for another player? And how do you differentiate yourself and get people to say, ooh, let's have a look at Rico? Okay, that's a good question. When we founded the company back in 2009, we spotted a real opportunity for enterprise applications in, in the mobile domain. Mm -hmm. There was a real lack of those at the time. The iPhone hadn't been around for very long. BlackBerry was the dominant mobile device. So we had the capability to produce a very strong BlackBerry-oriented mobile capture device mm -hmm. for um, time entry. And through the research we did at the time, we actually looked around at the market. And although you're saying that it was crowded with vendors, practice management vendors and the like, there weren't really many mobility based products and offerings out there. And actually, indeed, still aren't if you mm -hmm. look at the market in terms of it's one of the things that I think many enterprises are lacking is truly integrated uh, native applications in the mobile space. It's going to be a huge growth area moving forward. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a fair comment that uh, I first encountered you with somebody, I think it was uh, Big Ham, saying, oh, there's this great product called Recoup and it does time recording on the BlackBerry. And that's right. suddenly the BlackBerry became more than just um, a messaging device. It could be using that's serious right. legal software applications. Um, when you first cropped up on the radar, you were very much a BlackBerry specialist. Um, but since then, BlackBerry's had its ups and downs, mainly downs. We've got lots of new platforms coming along. Android, obviously iOS, still BlackBerry, Microsoft, desktop. What are your priorities now? How are you moving towards the future? And what's your vision for taking time recording forward? Well, that's a really good question. And it's a very um, core part of our strategy. And actually now a big barrier to entry for another vendor to come in because we've had experience now for that many years uh, mm -hmm. of developing native uh, mobile applications for the legal industry mm -hmm. and really now we're technology agnostic we have to be as a vendor mm -hmm. um, we, we we've carved a very complementary niche in the market we don't really have a direct competitor um, in terms of if you look at what we do we're a very unique business i think really we're the only business now globally that only does time capture solutions for the legal industry that's all we do mm -hmm. we don't have any other distractions in the business that gives us a ruthless focus an opportunity to actually become uh, technology agnostic and put the investment in our r d across platforms and that's something we've now done and uh, finalized this year with the launch of the android and the windows uh, applications but of course what's really important is that it is much more than mobility as well because if I cycle back to the vision that we had when we set the company up uh, and launched it in 2010 was actually let's try and utilize technology to fully automate the timesheet. And that's a real burden for the legal industry, as, as indeed many industries, not just the legal industry. But we felt if we focused on the legal industry and got that right, that yeah. would be our opportunity to shine. So where next for time tracking? You turn the clock on, you turn it off. What else can technology do? Where are you going next? Well, I think, again, when we're talking about the inception phase of the business, if I think I cycle back to the analogy that I used when I very first started doing this, and I actually looked at law firms and lifted the bonnet of their firm, so to speak, from a technology perspective, and actually made some analogies to the retail sector at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and this, this helps answer the question of, of, of the continuation of, of, of where we go moving forward. If you lift the bonnet of a, of a retailer, it's very different to a law firm. Uh, for example, if you buy a bottle of water in a supermarket, um, as soon as you scan it through the checkout, everything's automated, another one appears in the morning. The retailer knows the exact buy price of that bottle of water, the exact price they're going to sell it for, and therefore it knows the exact margin that it's going to make every time it sells it. With time recording, there's really two aspects, aren't there? There's the traditional contemporaneous, form of it, and then there's the newer um, found time, automatic time recording. Where does your systems fit into this uh, matrix? Well, look, we don't make those sort of vendor-based boundaries, really. Yeah. Some people talk about time entry, time capture, and all of this type of thing. 
it's not relevant really. Lawyers don't talk like that. You know, the industry doesn't talk like that. You want something to give you a helping hand through the day, through the week, through the month to help capture what you've been doing. Because what's really important over the last year, especially, we've noticed a big transition that one of the key business drivers for these technologies is that law firms need to understand the cost of delivering their legal services. Mm -hmm. Now, and it goes back to the retailing analogy, how can you understand the cost of something unless you know how much time it's taking? Because those the currency of law is time and all the cost models in legal break back to time in that yes. same way. I suppose one of the things that does puzzle some people is that law firms are under, especially large ones, under increasing pressure to keep their uh, time recording bills down because clients are wanting to get better value, more for less and so on. Um, isn't there a danger that your systems are actually going to go counter to this and end up with firms billing more than they should do or more to the point, they bill it and then they just have to write it off because the bill's too much, whereas if you can't remember what you did, then it, in the old way, you didn't, okay. you didn't do it. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, it how, do you, how do you sort of get that balance? I'm not okay. suggesting you're doing anything unethical, but how do you get the balance? No, I think the point is that we're doing what's right, and firms get this, is that firms want to understand what's going on. It's mm -hmm. the actual activity that's taking place. And that's billable activity, non-billable activity. It really doesn't matter, because again, if you're looking at the cost of delivering those services, any billing model that you want to overlay on top of that can come back to that information. Mm -hmm. Whether it's value-based billing, fixed fee, hourly rate billing, it doesn't really matter. They all come back to the cost is the same, the cost is increments of time. Mm -hmm. So that's the starting point we want to try and get to, capture everything. And then it's also severing the classic tie. Most lawyers, I believe, when they're time recording are thinking, I'm billing my client X many units yeah they're not thinking i'm capturing the cost of this activity mm -hmm. and i'll do the billing later mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. what's changing too that is changing you know a lot we're seeing it and again it is a bit of a catch-22 because with these systems you can now capture activity and then allow you to do billing as a secondary thing so that then you can really really see if you're if you're being uh, underutilized, overutilized, if you're if you're padding out your timesheet, if you're not if you're in the office for ten hours and only you're posting a timesheet of eight, yes. or what? Where are the other two hours? Mm. You can start seeing all of this stuff now, so you can really get to the bottom of interesting debates around performance, around profitability, and and typically, you know, I, I use the, the the term which I made up called quintuple discounting. So, what are these five ways? This this uh, quintuplet system you've got. That's a good question. <laughs> so the first one is that people just don't record time. Right. They just yeah. forget. And that happens in every law firm every day. Yes. People just forget because mm. we're human beings. Mm. And this is the thing. Why are we um, at, relying on that? You know, in, in the year 2014 for humans to remember stuff. Mm. Mm. Um, the second one is that when you record time, um, for whatever reason, and there are many business drivers why culturally this happens, but when one records time, they either under or over record it. And that's very, very common. Um, culturally, there are, you touched on the, the write-off pressure, there mm -hmm. are pressures to reduce write-offs. Um, so that could be one reason why people under-record yeah. time. Yeah. Um, and the next thing is when you're pushing that time into billing, then you discount it. Um, so that's your third level of, of discounting. And the fourth one is when the partner may then double discount that back mm -hmm. again, but not having any visibility or, or understanding that previously to that decision, there's already been three levels of discounting going on. Yes. Uh, and the fifth one, which is, is really obvious, and I call that the point of sale discounting, is when the classic um, handover of the, of the invoice and the, the sigh of intake of breath from the client, mm. um, gosh, you know, I thought it would be 15,000, not 20. Mm. Uh, and what does the lawyer do in response? Say, oh, okay, I'll tell you what then, fine. Either meet in the middle or, or let's, let's reduce it down by 5,000. Mm. And I honestly think on my travels quite comfortably that around 5% of turnover of a, of a typical law firm is discounted mm -hmm. by that fifth one alone. We've been tracking your wins and you've had them with large firms, you've had them with some mid-tier firms recently, um, including one in Manchester and Barlow, Robbins and Guildford. Uh, but just how scalable is your product, both in terms of going up in terms of larger firms and also going down in terms of affordability for mid-tier firms? Hmm. Well, that's a really good question and something we decided strategically right from the off that we would 
ensure that our system was the same. So we have DLA as a client, largest law firm in the world. Yeah. We have high street firms as clients, um, small as sort of 10 fianas. Uh, and we're now live in chambers as well. Um, I can't help notice that some of your recent wins have been with firms running relatively old fashioned technology. So is this another uh, opportunity for Recoup to breathe life into old fashioned practice management systems? You're right, if firms are, uh, have legacy systems, uh, or indeed have sat on IT investment. And I think this is also a very common thing, especially over the last five years, mm -hmm. um, is that many firms haven't really spent a lot of money in IT. Yeah. That we're now seeing, I'm sure you'd agree, that's changing this year. Uh, it's certainly a lot more vibrant as we start this new economic cycle. So I think there's a combination of two things there. The firms that uh, have kept up to date and invested, uh, we, can, we can innovate into those uh, and we can also very quickly innovate into some legacy systems that may indeed be over 10 years old. Mm -hmm. In fact, we've done integrations with homemade systems that pre predated the internet, you know, so uh, that shows you how bad it can be. But yes. really, it doesn't matter again for us. We are partner agnostic, technology agnostic. We'll breathe as much innovation into a, a law firm regardless of the system that they're using, really. Um, that's not a, a particular USP for us. Um, if you look at the different stables from the, the, leading, the leading practice management vendors, mm. uh, we have some of their largest clients across all of them, pretty much. Um, so whether it's Elite's latest offering of Venvision, mm -hmm. um, some of our recent wins are from uh, law yeah. firms using that, down to some of the other, other vendors that may not be so new, mm -hmm. um, we are equally as prevalent in those now. And I think we're struggling to find one that we haven't already integrated with now. Um, I've been hearing it for years, and you probably have as well, but is, are the days of the billable hour over? or? Are they still going to be there in one form or another? Look, I think it's um, it's going to be there in one form or another. I think in the professional services marketplace, that's just going to be part of the mix. But again, harping back to the biggest business driver, why firms are purchasing these technologies, it's not about wanting to bill by the hour. Mm -hmm. It's about understanding the cost of delivering legal services. And whatever billing methodology you want to overlay that onto that information, then it really doesn't matter quite honestly. Um, that's the power of what we do. Right. Um, and I think moving forward, if you look at our strategy for 2015, mm -hmm. we've got another exciting year of innovation ahead of us around well, what do we do with this information that we've captured? And really for me, that's just the start of the journey. Um, the last four years were about producing the technology that could achieve the vision of automating the production of the timesheet uh, and across multiple platforms. Um, now we've done that, well, what do we do with the data? And that's that's an exciting conversation for me to be having with law firms. Phil Wedward, thanks very much indeed for your time. Thank you. Thank you.